Today we start Unit 10, the Vietnam years, and I'm really looking forward to this unit because it covers the years 1965 to 1975, and a ton happened in America and in the world during that decade, from 1965-ish to around 1975. So much happened, so I'm looking forward to this unit. Hopefully you guys will enjoy it as well. Now the last thing we learned about in Unit 9 was the assassination of President John Kennedy. And as you know, whenever a president dies in office, his vice president has to succeed him. And John Kennedy's vice president was named Lyndon B. Johnson. Now, Lyndon Johnson was very, very different from John F. Kennedy. They were both Democrats. They ran together. Of course, they were running mates. And Johnson was Kennedy's vice president. But they had very different personalities. You know, John F. Kennedy was very handsome and charming. LBJ, Lyndon Johnson, did not really have that kind of persona, but at the same time, he was very well-connected in Congress. He was a career politician, and because he had good connections in Congress, he was able to pass a lot of legislation that John Kennedy was not able to pass, all right? So that's going to be our first page here, Lyndon Johnson's domestic policy, and you know the difference between domestic and foreign policy. Foreign policy is what a president has to deal with outside of our borders. Domestic is within our borders. And also, as you know, really the most contentious domestic policy of this time period is civil rights. All right. So this is fill in the blank notes here. Um, so you do not have to write all that much on this page. And then we're going to power through two more pages talking about the Vietnam War. All right. So civil rights legislation and the Great Society, two things to associate with Lyndon Johnson. All right. 1964, Johnson signed the Civil Rights Act, one of the most important laws passed by United States Congress, all right? So this law banned discrimination on the basis of race, religion, national origin, and gender, specifically with regards to segregation or employment opportunities, all right? So this really gave, especially African Americans, but really most minorities, a big step up in society, made sure they were treated equally. All right, so citizens had the right to go into and enter restaurants, parks, libraries, theaters, courts, pools, all right, really any public space now, citizens had the right to go in there. Whereas before, you would see signs that say, no coloreds allowed in this restaurant or a whites only water fountain or something like that. So the Civil Rights Act of 1964 banned all of that. And the law greatly changed the United States because it fined all public accommodations and businesses that admitted discrimination. All right. Now that's a really big deal. This didn't just say, hey, you can't do it. It actually targeted people's money saying, hey, if you do this, this is the consequence. It actually had a monetary consequence. And that's what really drove about this change because businesses did not want to lose money just for the sake of holding on to their prejudices. The Civil Rights Act was the idea of President Kennedy. It was his idea before he was assassinated, but remember, as I said, he did not have the connections in Congress that Johnson had and was not able to get this signed in his lifetime. But it was a major advancement for the civil and political rights of African Americans. Now, civil rights meaning things like segregation, employment opportunities, political rights meaning things like the right to vote and hold public office. Civil, I should say, equality, not inequality, so cross out the I-N there. Civil equality was slowly being expanded and the civil and political rights of black people were now being protected by the U.S. federal government instead of just the government of some states. Southern states were now required to protect African-American freedoms. And in addition to the Civil Rights Act of 1964, there was also the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And this stated that the U.S. government would send people to southern states to make sure that blacks could vote, all right, to make sure that things like the grandfather clause and the literacy test and the poll tax were not being used, these Jim Crow laws were not being used to hinder black people from exercising their political right to vote, all right? So the Voting Rights Act, it prohibited, as we said, the literacy test, which required a black voter to be able to read and write a selected passage of written material, all right? So that's unconstitutional because, that's the next blank there, right? Uh, it is unconstitutional because the 15th Amendment said that 
one's right to vote shall not be infringed on the basis of color. That if you only have black people being forced to take these tests, which were entirely too hard and white people didn't have to, that was unconstitutional, and it was declared so with the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Now, the literacy test was a hindrance to black voters, just like the grandfather clause was, just like the poll tax was, which we'll talk about in a minute here, because most of the voters with the literacy test, would, they, would, they would have to take these very, very difficult tests. They would make it much harder for African Americans than for whites. All right? A lot of us in here would have trouble answering these questions correctly if we took that test today. So political inequality was slowly being erased, and the civil and political rights of African Americans were being extended by the efforts of the U.S. government. Also in 1964, the 24th Amendment was passed, and this stated that a poll tax to vote in federal elections was unconstitutional. So now not only can you not require people to have to read and write a certain passage to vote, you also can't require that they pay money to vote, all right? So charging people to vote goes against our civil and political rights, according to the 24th Amendment, which was passed also in 1964. Now, this stated that in federal elections it was unconstitutional, and this amendment really opened the door for African Americans to vote. And the impact of this was expansion of civil and political rights for African Americans. So that's one thing that Lyndon Johnson focused on during his years as president was the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act. And another thing that he really believed in was something called the Great Society, the Great Society. And this was in some ways similar to the New Deal. This was a series of government programs to assist poor people in general, but African Americans specifically, in obtaining better education and job training. Now, a lot of the, the Great Society programs were aimed at increasing the standard of living of both poor black people and poor white people. It was trying to eradicate poverty, eliminate poverty in the United States through the creation of government programs. So in a lot of ways, this was similar to the New Deal. And as you remember with the New Deal, it was partially good, partially bad. Um, the good parts increased voter and citizen participation in the stock market and the banks and things like that. Some of the bad parts were government overreach, getting too involved in the economy and people's lives, and the Great Society was kind of similar in that way. So black poverty was one of the most serious problems faced in the U.S. by the 1960s, and racism and discrimination, of course, contributed to the lack of resources and jobs available to African Americans in the 1960s. You would have a lot of employers who just would not hire black people. And that really hindered your ability to get a job, even if you are well qualified, all right? So the Great Society helped to eliminate that kind of prejudice. Also, one of the most important Great Society programs was Medicaid and Medicare. The difference between Medicaid and Medicare is that Medicaid is government assistance to poor people for health care, and Medicare is government assistance for old people for health care, all right? And these two things are still in effect today. They cost a lot of taxpayer dollars, but they also do help a lot of people, right? So that can kind of be debated about whether that's good or bad or, or a little of both, kind of like with most of the Great Society, just like with most of the New Deal. Now, President Johnson was responsible for getting the Great Society programs passed by Congress. Again, Kennedy originally proposed these laws, but could not get Congress to pass them. But since Johnson had more leverage in Congress, he had been in Congress for a really long time, career politician, as I said, he was able to get this passed, all right? So this was a big focus of his during his presidency were all of these social programs and legislations that he was trying to get passed. And the Great Society especially cost a lot of money. And another thing that cost a ton of money while Lyndon Johnson was president was the Vietnam War. Now, the Vietnam War and the Great Society together both costing Americans a ton of money, really increased government spending quite a bit, is a big reason why the economy started to tank in the 1970s, which we'll get to more next unit, all right? But we just went over Lyndon Johnson's domestic policy. Now we will get into his much more famous foreign policy with regard to the Vietnam War. Now, some of us probably know people who fought in the Vietnam War. If so, be sure to thank them for their service. It was a very controversial war. A lot of people say maybe we shouldn't have 
gotten in at all, and certainly we did make a lot of mistakes. And in a lot of ways, it really was President Johnson's war. He is the only one who really escalated the war to a very large extent. And most of the fighting, most of the killing took place during his years as president. All right, so we're going to go into the details of the Vietnam War, specifically in the 1960s during President Johnson's time in office. Now, before we get into that, first, I want to talk about Vietnam itself, where it's located, just so we can get kind of in our minds a good idea of what we're talking about here. So Vietnam is located in Southeast Asia. It's in that little box there. And here it is kind of zoomed in, all right? So in the map on the side of page three, I want you to label several things that I have written down here, all right? The first thing I want you to label is the 17th parallel. That's that line that cuts Vietnam in half. That was a line that was drawn in 1954 when the French left Vietnam and said, okay, north of this line is going to be communist, south of this line is going to be anti-communist. Very similar to Korea, and we thought it would work. Hanoi, next thing to label. Hanoi was the capital of North Vietnam. So where you see that star, or in this case a black dot, put Hanoi. That was the capital of North Vietnam. And then Saigon was the capital of South Vietnam. We put that where the star or the black dot is in South Vietnam. Now these days, it is no longer called Saigon. It is called Ho Chi Minh City because when the communists won the Vietnam War, they renamed the South's capital after their leader, Ho Chi Minh. That's why you see a lot of Vietnamese restaurants called Saigon because a lot of Vietnamese refugees came to America in the 1970s and 80s after they lost the Vietnam War and fell to communism to escape that oppressive regime of the Vietnamese communists, and they came to America, and a lot of them started restaurants, named them Saigon. I've eaten at at least three or four Vietnamese places called Saigon Restaurant, and that's because they want to hold on to the name Saigon, since technically it's not called that anymore, since now it's communist. Next is the Gulf of Tonkin. That is this body of water right here. A very important incident took place there that we'll talk about in a minute, so label that. Next, China. China is right to the north here. It borders Vietnam to the north. Laos, right here, borders North Vietnam. And finally, Cambodia, right here, borders South Vietnam to the west. So make sure you have those seven things labeled on here because we're going to be referring back to this map. All right, the Vietnam War began when North Vietnam tried to take over South Vietnam, said, hey, um, the North Koreans tried it. They almost succeeded. Maybe we can succeed and unite all of Vietnam under one communist flag with Ho Chi Minh as the leader. And the United States got involved in Vietnam for the same reason we got involved in Korea. As the most powerful nation in the world, as the number one military in the world ever since World War II, we saw it as our responsibility to contain communism where it was and make sure it does not spread, all right? So the U.S. wanted to prevent communist gains in Southeast Asia. And the Vietnam conflict, just like Korea, it's an attempt to stop the spread of communism known as containment. Now, it really all began with American involvement with the Gulf of Tonkin incident. This is where the fighting really started on the American side. So there were two U.S. Navy ships and a North Vietnamese ship. They attacked each other off the coast of North Vietnam. Now, it's not very clear what exactly happened here, who fired first, how many were injured, what exactly went down. There's no video or radio evidence of exactly what happened. So we're relying on kind of secondhand sources here to tell us what happened in the Gulf of Tonkin. But basically, it was broadcasted in American newspapers that there was firing going on in the Gulf of Tonkin, war breaking out with the Americans in Vietnam. So after this incident, the Tonkin Gulf Resolution was passed, and this granted the U.S. president broad military powers in Vietnam, saying this is now a time of war. We really need our commander-in-chief to have as much mobility, as much power as possible, so we need to give President Johnson all the power that he needs in order to get done what needs to get done in Vietnam. The U.S. war in Vietnam lasted from 1965 to 1973 officially. Now, the Vietnam War in general started before that and kept going after that, but American involvement was confined to those 
eight years. And the U.S. was on the side of what we know as ARVN, A-R-V-N, the Army of the Republic of Vietnam, also known as South Vietnam. Of course, we aided the South because they also were anti-communist. And one group that fought against the U.S. in Vietnam is called the Viet Cong, or the VC, important group to know. This was a group of South Vietnamese who actually supported communist North Vietnam. They wanted to become communist. They wanted the North to take over their homeland of South Vietnam, all right? So you can understand how difficult it would be to fight an enemy like that when we can't even comprehend. Like, why would anyone support communism? Well, obviously, they didn't really understand fully what it was like, and also their current leadership was not very good either, all right? So just like with the French Revolution, yeah, the French revolutionaries did terrible things, but at the same time, they were trying to replace something that was really bad too. So the Viet Cong, while certainly the bad guys, they also were rebelling against a not perfect South Vietnamese government. So that's important to understand there. Now, the Viet Cong fought with the Viet Minh. The Viet Minh was the group of North Vietnamese communists led by Ho Chi Minh, this guy right here, right? So the two sides here, all right, it was the United States and Arvin versus the Viet Cong and the Viet Minh. Important to get those two sides in your mind before we go on here. One person that often has a lot of influence at a time of war is a president's secretary of defense. A president's secretary of defense, they are really in charge of the military, just directly under the president, but pretty much second in command to the commander in chief. And Lyndon Johnson, secretary of defense, was named Robert McNamara, Bob McNamara. And he was a very decorated soldier. He was one of Kennedy's former advisors who actually helped to resolve the Cuban Missile Crisis, so he had some accomplishments under his belt there. And both McNamara and LBJ were very optimistic that the U.S. would succeed in containing communism to North Vietnam, and therefore they refused to ever remove troops. In fact, they always insisted on adding more and more and more and more troops to the point where it was over half a million American boots on the ground in South Vietnam by 1968, all right? So a lot of people blame both McNamara and Johnson for the debacle, the quagmire that would turn into what we now know of as the Vietnam War. The Ho Chi Minh Trail, another really important geographical thing to know about. You might even want to draw this trail on the map on page three here because it's really important. This was a heavily guarded and highly sophisticated path from North Vietnam to South Vietnam. Now, obviously, it couldn't go straight through the demilitarized zone in the middle at the 17th parallel because there were so many guards there. So what they did is they went into neighboring Laos and Cambodia in order to get weapons and troops and supplies along this trail. They, the Viet Minh troops moved thousands of tons of weapons, thousands of supplies, thousands of men along this trail to supply the Viet Cong, which gave them a huge advantage in the war. A lot of people say that Vietnam is exactly like Korea. Well, a big difference between Vietnam and Korea is that Korea is a peninsula, which means it's surrounded by water on three sides, but Vietnam is only surrounded by water on two sides. And on the west, they have more land. They have other countries that got dragged into this war, right? So this is what gave the communists a huge advancement, a huge advantage in this war because they knew the terrain way better than the Americans did and had this very sophisticated trail called the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Operation Rolling Thunder is the first major U.S. military mission you need to know about, and this was a three-year-long U.S. bombing campaign against the North Vietnamese. We just bombed them and bombed them and bombed them in, instead of invading North Vietnam. A lot of strategists say that in hindsight, it probably would have been much better to actually invade North Vietnam, that we might have actually been successful there, kind of going all in there, instead of just bombing them from the air and staying in South Vietnam. But nonetheless, this is exactly what happened. It was a three-year-long bombing campaign. About 100,000 North Vietnamese were killed, civilians and soldiers. About 1,000 U.S. soldiers were shot down and either killed or captured as prisoners of war. One of the famous American pilots who was shot down was a guy named John McCain. He would later run for president in 2008, and he actually died in 2018, 
but he was a U.S. soldier in Vietnam. He got shot down and spent years at what was known as the Hanoi Hilton, which was a terrible prisoner of war camp where he was tortured and, and beaten until he was finally released in the 1970s. Now, this is seen as a failed operation, Operation Rolling Thunder, because while, yes, a lot of communists were killed, at the same time, the communists continued to fight us. They were not deterred by this. Remember, they do not have the same quality of, of life, or it's the same value they put, I, sh I should say, on, on human life that Americans and most Westerners do, all right? So it's seen as a failed operation because, in a sense, it really did not work. Now, there was a military draft throughout the Vietnam conflict, and this is one thing that people really need to know in order to understand some of the terrible things about the Vietnam War, and that's because so many people were being drafted, and we're talking like 18-year-olds, 19-year-olds, and 20-year-olds being drafted by the thousands into the U.S. Army to go fight in Vietnam, and this was a war that a lot of people did not support. Certainly the majority of people did, but a lot of people didn't, all right? And the average age of U.S. soldiers in Vietnam was 19. That's incredibly young. That is unparalleled in warfare, all right? In World War II, the average age of an American soldier was 23. In other wars, it's been even older, all right? But 19 was the average age for soldiers in Vietnam. So very, very young to be asked to give your life for your country, especially if you're not willing to or you don't believe in the cause of the war. And a lot of people were angry that men so young were being sent to die in Vietnam. And one common chant by anti-war protesters, like outside of the White House, they would chant, hey, hey, LBJ, how many kids did you kill today? So people blamed him, people blamed McNamara, and really the entire situation for what was going on. Vietnam was called the Living Room War. That was the nickname it was given. And the reason why it was called the Living Room War is because by now you have televisions in every single household, pretty much, in America. Ninety-some percent of households have at least one television. Now, that was not the case in World War II. That was not the case even in Korea. But now, with the Vietnam War in the 1960s and 1970s, most Americans own a television. And with Vietnam, there was constant nightly news coverage of the war on television. And families would watch this every night in their living rooms. They would hear how many American boys died that day. They would hear about the military operations and how many people were being killed or wounded. And one result of constant TV news broadcast keeping Americans informed and up to date is that more and more anti-war protests against the Vietnam conflict started to take place in the United States. Never before had a war received so much resistance from the people within the United States. You didn't have many people protesting Korea. You didn't have many people protesting World War II. And it, it was just not a very common thing. But now, with Vietnam, it became much more common to protest because so many people did not believe that we should be fighting this war. And this only increased, this sentiment in America only increased with this terrible event called the My Lai Massacre the My Lai Massacre, and this was when a group of U.S. soldiers in Vietnam killed about 400 unarmed civilians in South Vietnam. Now, that's just terrible. They were unarmed, they were completely not a threat, and these U.S. soldiers just gunned them down. And Americans heard this and they said, wait a second, we're supposed to be the good guys. We're supposed to be over there helping these people. But now these few soldiers just killed hundreds of them. So what are we even doing over there? if we're not really helping them out. Now, it's important to notice to note that most American soldiers over there were the good guys, okay? And most American soldiers did not do things like this. But the fact that even some did things like this made a lot of Americans say, okay, we got to get out of Vietnam because people are dying because of America instead of in spite of America. So these morally wrong actions by the U.S. soldiers really kind of rocked the American public and really fueled, put, put fuel to the fire of the anti-war movement. And this was a time of a lot of division in America. A lot of people talk about how today America is divided, and certainly it is, but this country has been divided before, and it was very, very divided in the 1960s and 70s, specifically with the issue of Vietnam. In addition to all the issues with civil rights and things like that, you also had huge divisions with the Vietnam War. And you were pretty much labeled one of two things. You were either a hawk or you were a dove. All right, now hawks were Americans who supported the war in Vietnam, and doves 
were Americans who protested against the war in Vietnam, all right? People who would get drafted and just burn their draft cards and, and refuse to go and consequently have to flee to Canada or get jailed. People would march, people would protest, shout, no, no, we won't go, and there were all sorts of anti-war protests, all right? So hawks supported the war, doves did not support the war. Now, there were more hawks than doves. Hawks outnumbered doves, especially at the beginning, but even up until the end, there were more hawks than doves in America. But the doves were much more vocal, and their numbers grew as the war went on. So a lot of times, it's not the majority that gets their message heard. It's usually those who are the loudest or have the best communication techniques or something like that, or whoever has the media on their side. And a lot of the media were doves and did not support the war effort either. The Tet Offensive was the biggest battle in the Vietnam War. Definitely something you need to know here. The Tet Offensive. This was a three-phase North Vietnamese attack on Arvin, on the Army of the Republic of Vietnam, South Vietnam, that took place from January all the way to September of 1968. It was something during what's called the Tet Holiday in Vietnam, kind of like Christmas or Thanksgiving or or the 4th of July or something like that would be here in America. Usually people aren't prepared for an attack that day. They think that's a rest day, a holiday. And that's why the communists attacked on that day, because we weren't expecting it. So this was a campaign of surprise bombing attacks against military and civilian command and control centers all throughout South Vietnam. This battle, the Tet Offensive, is portrayed in the film Full Metal Jacket. If you've ever seen that, I think it's on Netflix, but it is portrayed in that movie. And while the U.S. and South Vietnam were able to fight back against the Viet Cong and the Viet Minh, the highest number of U.S. casualties took place during the Tet Offensive. This is when you would watch the news and and learn that dozens of American soldiers died just that day. And you hear at the end of the week that maybe 130, 140, 150 Americans died that week, or sometimes even numbers into the thousands in one week. All right. So while this was technically a victory for the U.S. and for South Vietnam, and it was the largest military operation of the war, we took it as a loss because so many of our people died, and it was just a, a huge blow to morale in the United States. And then you had even speakers like Martin Luther King Jr. going against the Vietnam War, being against it, becoming doves, and you had a lot more people switching from hawk to dove. One immediate consequence of the Tet Offensive was that support for the war declined in the United States. You had an increase of anti-war sentiment, and you had a decrease in number of people who supported President Johnson and the war. And by 1968, with the war going just terribly, and the American public growing more and more discontent with its leaders like President Johnson and McNamara, McNamara actually resigned. He resigned his position as Secretary of Defense right after the Tet Offensive began because it was clear that his strategies did not work. It's, it's been a complete disaster, and so he resigned. And then the very next month, President Johnson shocked the entire country by announcing that he will not run for another term as president. Now, he could have run for another term because while he was president for about a year before his first full term, he was still allowed to run for a second full term, even though it would have been a little bit more than eight years. So he shocked the country in announcing that he would not run for another term as president, partially because he was so bogged down by the war, so stressed out and everything by the war that he did not want to be president anymore. But also, there's no way he would have won. He would not have won re-election in 1968, even if he had tried because the people were just fed up with him and wanted to go in a different direction. All right, so the war had really taken its toll on both men and their public support, as had it taken, uh, taken its toll on the entire American people. Now, although the anti-war movement was large and getting larger throughout the war, it's also important to understand that not everyone opposed the war. A very large percentage of Americans remained hawks until the very end but they were much less vocal about their support than doves were. In fact, Richard Nixon would later on call them the silent majority. You may have heard that term before, the silent majority, that a lot of times the majority of people in a country believe a certain thing, but you only hear the other end of the argument because those people, while the minority, are a little bit more vocal. That's why Richard Nixon called hawks or you know conservatives or 
pro-Vietnam people or Republicans in general called them the silent majority. One thing that gave the Viet Cong and the Viet Minh a huge advantage in Vietnam was because it, it was their home turf. Okay, They had home field advantage. They knew the terrain very, very well, much better than the Americans knew the terrain. They would often set up hidden traps in the jungles. They would create this series of underground tunnels that they would hide in and attack from. This is just one diagram here. They would make just these really elaborate tunnels where they would basically live underground like rodents and they would attack from there and they would set up all these traps that Americans might fall into. In fact, Colin Powell, one of the people we talked about during Black History Month, he fought in Vietnam and he fell into one of these traps that you see here and was speared by one of those punchy sticks that would, that, would, that would stab you if you fell into it. The Pentagon Papers were released a couple years after President Johnson left office, but this was a report that revealed evidence that the Johnson administration had not been fully honest with the public or Congress about Vietnam, that they had hidden some things, that they had lied about some things, they had not been honest about some of the operations that went down in Vietnam. And we learned from the Pentagon Papers when they were released and found by the Washington Post in 1971, we found out that there had been a lot of bombings, a lot of attacks, a lot of coastal raids that had not been reported to the public or to Congress, all right? So this was a big thing that people were saying, man, we thought it was bad already, but now we know that the president and and McNamara and, and, and all the others were just lying to us, and it was actually even worse, all right? So the Pentagon Papers was a huge blow to public support and confidence and trust in the government. So finally here, by the end of Johnson's presidency, which ended on January 20th, 1969, there were approximately 550,000 U.S. soldiers deployed in Vietnam. Over half a million American men were fighting on the ground in Vietnam. And when President Nixon became president right after Johnson, he slowly but steadily removed these troops. All right. So if you look at a chart of American troop presidents' presence in Vietnam, it's going to rise steeply every year that Johnson is president. And then once Nixon becomes president, it's going to decline steadily for about four years until the war actually ends. All right. But the U.S. would remain in Vietnam, as I said, for about another four years. And that is what we will pick up on next class. Let me know if you have any questions or if I can explain anything further.